I'm going to talk a little bit about, I guess, well, I'll talk a bit about the professional diploma at the end, actually, and some of the stuff we'll cover there. But a lot of what I'm talking about today draws on everything else you've heard so far. So you mightn't think data analytics has anything to do with storytelling. Uh, there's obviously lots of problem solving and critical thinking, but there's huge amounts of communication as well that, that goes into all of this. Um, so how many times have we seen this? You know, your data, it's the mo your most valuable resource in your company. It's going to help us to find new insights about our business. It's going to revolutionize everything. We want to become data driven. We want to become evidence based. Um, and in 2009, statisticians worldwide celebrated the fact that Hal Varian said being a statistician was the job to have for the next decade. And we went from, you know, being the, the bridesmaid to the bride for, uh, for the first time. We were all new intro stats courses had this up on their first slide to, to kind of entice people to take on stats, which I guess would probably have been a bit off-putting to many. Um, our, our joy didn't last very long in 2012. We were quickly replaced by data science. Um, and now since then, what we've kind of seen is this whole melee of different words that kind of mean the same thing, but then also don't. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that today. So if you look at kind of um, the most promising jobs list, for example, from LinkedIn over the past few years, this new term data science has kind of replaced the other things that are there. And actually last year, a data scientist was ranked number one in the most promising, promising jobs worldwide. Um, alongside that, if you talk about the skill sets that people have, and Chris touched on this, what we saw in maybe this space was people wanted more specific skills. So can you visualize data, you know, data visualization skills? And that's kind of morphed into something a little bit softer. Um, this idea of digital literacy, data literacy, critical thinking, problem solving, they're the skills now that we're seeing, not the specific, can you solve an equation and do a nice model for me? And so we kind of had to move our education to, to fit into this a little bit. Um, everybody wants to be doing the data thing. Everybody talks about their data and everybody wants to use it in a better way. But actually, how do you even start that process? And there's such a range of, I suppose, different levels that people are, are at in their companies and that companies are at as well. Um, there's a huge amount of confusion about what that actually means. What does it mean to be data driven, evidence based for me or for my specific company? So I'll touch on a little bit of that um, today. And I think a lot of the, the problem is, is that this language around data and data science or whatever way you want to think about it is, is really difficult to figure out. Everything sounds the same and yet everything is different. And we're all advocating for you to use AI. We've heard a lot about that, lots of hype about AI. It's going to take over the world and all of that. We've had machine learning. Um, it's not cool to do statistics anymore, so we've had to rebrand into data science very, very rapidly. Um, and so I, I'm a statistician, but now I'm a professor of data science, so I've gone and undergone a rebrand myself. Um, I'm a statistician at heart, so I'm not going to talk about AI machine learning there a little bit outside of what we do in the, in the course. Obviously, they're very important tools, and it's important to know when to use what tool where, I would say. I'm going to focus in a bit on the data science bit. What is that? Um, and then where's statistics in this? Because in the, the professional diploma, we actually take quite a statistical viewpoint of the world. And I, I'm, I'm, I guess just to give you a feel for why it is we do that. So what is data science? Now, this is what I think it is. And I found this really nice quote. Depending on who you talk to, they'll maybe have a slightly different idea. But I like this because of the word multidisciplinary. So we've moved away from this notion that you have a person that comes in and they can be a statistician and they can work away in their corner and that's the end of it. In data science, it's far broader than that. We're talking about lots of different people with lots of different skills coming together to be a data science team. Nobody really has all of these skills on their own. Um, and so th this definition is the one that, that I really like. And so if we think about data science, it's really got three core pillars. It's got your math stats 
underpinning and your foundations, obviously you need those skills as part of it. You also need to be good with your computing skills because you're pulling data in from databases, you're trying to manipulate it, you're trying to do stuff with it. You have to be comfortable doing stuff with your computers. And we have this domain expertise piece. Um, like if you're trying to become data driven in your company, you have to be able to implement that in your company, right? So you have to use the resources that you have. You have to understand what's going on in your process really, really well to get the most out of the data. Um, and then it has to actually be implementable at the end. There's no point in fit and fancy models and then it being absolutely useless to you. And kind of in between these then, we have maybe the more traditional bits that we would have seen before. So math stats research, we quite often work with people in different domains. Um, machine learning is kind of a hybrid between maths and stats and, and computer science. And then there's kind of all this data processing piece that goes in the bottom. And again, there's slightly different versions of this, but this one I like. So what's, what's a modern data scientist then? If you're looking at jobs for somebody who's a data, going into a data science role, what are the skills that you need? Well, you need to be very good at maths and stats. So you need to be able to fit statistical models and you need to know about designing experiments to collect data. And you need to know all about these fancy learning algorithms and you need, need to be able to optimize. You need domain knowledge. You have to have all the problem solving strategic bit. You need to be innovative, you have to collaborate, and then you also need to have your programming skills and you have to be good with all of the different programming languages. And then you also need to be able to be a good communicator. Um, and when I'm looking at this, I'm like, good luck finding somebody with that because somebody with all those skills, <laughs> you know, <laughs> does not exist. Um, and so I guess one of the things that we see a lot is one person in a company will be hired to be a data scientist and they're expected to do all of this. It's a recipe for failure, unfortunately. You need to have a few people in the company that are able to work with data and bring those different skill sets together uh, to be able to have that, that that's complete skill set. So it's really about bringing together people with lots of complementary skills that can be a, a data science team. I'll come back to that a little bit later on. So where does statistics fit into all of this and why do we care about that so much? Well, again, technology has just taken off. Depending on the, the business or industry that you're in, you might have a sensor stuck on every single machine on a production line cal or collecting information at millisecond rates all day long, 24 hours a day. Or you might have the situation where you have stuff that's still on paper and it has to be digitized and somebody has to do that. That is the, the spectrum that we're at, right? So we have data being generated. It's just getting bigger, this notion of big data. And what we want to be able to do is actually extract valuable information. It's very different to information and draw meaningful conclusions from it. And by that, I mean do stuff that's good for the business. Where statistics fits in and how it's a little bit different is we care about the uncertainty bit, all right? So if you think about AI machine learning type stuff, we give it loads of data and out the other end pops a yes, no, go, don't type of answer. Turn it off, switch it on. In statistics, and I don't mean to make it sound really exciting, we're interested in the gray bits, you know? Um, how thrilling does that sound? Um, but by that, I mean not the black and white decisions, the kind of bit we're not sure about in the middle. And actually, that's the important bit, I would argue. We're interested in understanding, well, where does the uncertainty come from? Is it in my data? Where is it in my data? Have I stuff that's measured that's, you know, maybe a little bit less uncertain than others? And if my model predicts something, well, am I very certain about that prediction or am I a little bit uncertain? And what's the risk in getting this wrong? And we can capture that in statistics. That's a little <laughs> bit different to maybe some of the other approaches. It's hard, it's not, it's not easy, um, but it does give you a really strong foundation for being able to answer your interesting questions. <coughs> okay, so I would brand this slide uh, statistical thinking. There's elements in here of 
of Chris's critical thinking as well. And you saw the DMAIC stuff that he put up there. This is kind of the design measure bit as well. So there's lots of links in there. And this sounds like the easy bit. Um, it sounds like the bit, you know, people would know. But actually, we often find that that's the bit that's missing. Um, what is the actual thing that I care about? Is it my customers? Is it the, the yield that's coming off my line? What is it that's really important to me as a business and what's the thing that I'm trying to solve? Stuff is just collected often in, in companies, right? And there's a fear of if I don't collect it and I might need it and you know, what if I don't collect it and everybody else is collecting it and I don't have it? There's a little bit of, of kind of collecting stuff for the sake of collecting stuff because you can. Um, and often that's not what you need to do. You need to go back to the start and figure out what is my question? And then you can figure out the bit about the data. So what data do I need in that scenario? Do I have it already? Do I not? Can I measure it if I don't have it? Um, and, and, and this is kind of an iterative process often. Um, and the last bit then is, well, if I don't have it, how do I, how do I measure it? If, if I do have it, can I access it? So we often find stuff being stored in pockets in, in companies. And actually, nobody knows what anybody has. Um, if you're talking about a multinational, often stuff that doesn't get shared from a US site with the Irish site, even if they might be doing things that are quite similar. Um, and so there's huge issues around how you store your data. If I'm pulling things from different sources, can I put it in somewhere together and make it all consistent and, and be able to use that? All of these types of things go into this planning and designing stage. And again, this is the bit that takes time. But if you do this right, and you've heard that message a few times, I think, today, if you do this right, it makes everything else so much easier. Um, and we do a lot of work, so we work with a lot of companies who come to us wanting to work with us on research projects, and we spend it not all, nearly all of our time doing this, first and foremost, and then we can, we can go on and do the actual stuff. So if we have our question of interest and we start to think about a statistical analysis, what does that actually look like? And there's really three core phases of this. So we talk about the data collection bit, we'll come back to that in a minute. Once you have your data, then you can start to think about visualizing it, summarizing it, finding patterns in there that might be interesting. And the last bit then is actually maybe more modeling, predictive modeling pieces like that. How I generalize the results for this line to the whole factory. I've deliberately put the cog of the data collection again as the largest. This is the most important part. And I'll look, talk to each one of these bits in a little bit more detail. So data collection is the most important step, but it's often the bit that's given the least thought. There's a whole variety of reasons for that. Data are found, so they're scraped off something or they're you know, just collected by accident, collected in a bit of an ad hoc way, without thinking about, well, what's the end goal here? So you can have huge volumes of data collected, but they're not really useful for doing the thing you want. Okay, so you're spending lots of money on storing things, but actually, if you thought about your question, you could think about being more efficient in your data collection. And I really want to get this message across. There is absolutely no approach, whatever that might look like, that will help in this scenario if your data are poor quality. So there's, a, there's an idea there that if you have lots of data, there has to be something useful in it. And that is just not true. Actually, collecting lots and lots of data can just add noise to the process and make things far more difficult for you. Um, and so that's one of the key things, I think, um, to remember. So in statistics, we worry an awful lot about that piece and making sure the data we're collecting is fit for purpose. Um, so if you don't think about your data collection procedure, you don't think about that too well, well, then you can have this scenario where you end up with data that's biased or you have incomplete information and that knocks on right through to the end. And your decision making at the end then is problematic. Okay. Okay. The other thing that's a little bit different about statisticians, and this is some of the stuff we, we again, we look at in the PD, 
the context in which the data are collected, and Lisa mentioned this, the who, what, where, how and why your data are collected are really, really important. So I'm going to give you a hypothetical example here, and I want you to tell me what I should do in this situation. So start a new role in 2015, very demanding bosses, long hours, not many breaks. You didn't get any training on the jobs. So there wasn't too many opportunities to upskill. Pay wasn't great. Very, very limited job satisfaction. Some days it was great, some days it wasn't. Um, so if I put that data into an AI model, what would it tell me to do? Stay on, leave? <laughs> what we're missing is the data context. I'm not going to lie, there's days I do want to run to the hills. There's days I go for bread and have a coffee and a star bar in my car <laughs> in peace. However, I can't leave them. They're too cute. So the data context is so important. Now, this is a silly example. We can see this is very obvious. If you have reams of data without any context, then we have a problem at the end. We have bad decisions. So, uh, you know, kind of understanding, being able to look at your data in that way is so, so important. And you'll hear lots of people saying, oh, we've lot, we, we don't care what the data are. You know, mm -hmm. we'll just put it into an algorithm. It's fine, it's, it's just data. Statistics, we don't think like that. The context is absolutely key. Okay, now, nobody wants to hear this, but data cleaning is absolutely essential. Um, this is the hard sell. So, it is hard work, it's unseen work, it's not valued work. Um, if you're a boss with somebody who's doing data analytics and they tell you day after day they're data cleaning and you're looking at them going, what are you doing? They are actually data cleaning and 80% of your time will probably be spent just getting your data into a format that's useful, that's usable, that is consistent, etc. And again, if you don't do this, if you don't put the effort in here, nothing that comes out is going to be useful. So again, time spent here is time well spent. Why do you do it? You want to make sure your data are complete. So what that means is, is there big chunks of it missing? So if I have a sensor in a machine and I have a big chunk missing, then does that mean there's a problem with the machine or is the sensor just not working? What is it? You want it to be as complete as possible. You want it to be consistent. So if I'm current trying to merge stuff across lots of different databases, for example, and I have dates which are a nightmare to work with, and Excel turns the number two into 12, zero, one, whatever, for some unknown reason, um, how do you make sure that all of that matches up? Because an algorithm is, is stupid. It doesn't know that this date is the same as this date if it looks different. You have to have that consistency. It needs to be accurate, so you're measuring the thing you think you're measuring, valid, needs to be relevant to your, your, your company. And if you're talking about real-time stuff, it has to be coming at you in the time frame that you need it. No point in doing real-time analytics with stuff from six months ago. So these are just some examples. Again, you know, you might want to convert some stuff into text, or you, here's a dates one. So again, making sure that it's all consistent, clean, etc. And again, that takes time, um, and data consistency is the, the gold standard. And again, not all data are created equal. Some of it contains more information, some of it is more consistent, but data that has these properties are more valuable to you than reams of stuff that are, does not have that. Okay, now this is blurry for a reason. Um, once you have all of those bits done and you ha you're happy that your data are consistent and clean and ready to go, you can start doing useful stuff with it. And I'll talk a bit about a case study in a little while that shows how we implemented some of this. This is just a dashboard from that case study. Again, data visualization, being able to see the things that you're interested in in front of you um, is so important. And, and you know, it's one of those things that we probably don't value right as much as we should. And then you can do whatever kind of modeling you want, and it can be as complicated as you want, and it goes back to the original question you have. These are just examples. I'm not going to tell you any maths or anything like that about them. But you might want to look at relationships between stuff. You might want to cluster things into groups that look similar. You might want to do this kind of binary decision making, where if I have this information, I make that call. If I have this information, then it's something else. Two slides versus four for the other one. So we have this, oh, again, 
this data pipeline, so again, and this really is what I mean by a kind of a statistical analysis pipeline. Data, 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 cool stuff, knowledge, right? So there's lots and lots of steps here to get to the bit where you're going to do the cool stuff, is the point. Okay, so I'll give a quick overview of, of a simple case study that we, we worked on, and it'll give you an idea as to the steps in the process that we implemented. Now, this is one of the first industry projects that I, I actually worked on. I was as green as grass, and I learned an awful lot of stuff from this. So going back to the don't be afraid to make mistakes, I've made them all, believe me. Um, and, and again, the learnings from that have really fed a lot into how we inter interact and engage since. So this was with a med device company in, in Cork. They were looking at their process and they were basically putting sensors onto all of their machines on their line. The sensors were collecting real-time information and they had identified their business needs. They wanted to understand how those inputs affected their product quality, but they also wanted, and this was the big one for them, to figure out how to reduce their scrap levels. So it was costing them several million euro every year in scrap. Um, and it was starting to affect their production capacity because some of the things they were producing didn't go into the, the bin. They went back and were reworked. So it was delaying everything and that was impacting their customer. So they knew if they could figure out this bit, then that would impact customers in a positive way. So what were the business aims? Well, data-driven decision-making, the usual one, prove cost-effectiveness, market of competitiveness. I call this white box modeling. So again, with machine learning AI, you can give it lots of data. You don't really see what's happening on the insides and then you get something out. By contrast, they wanted this kind of transparent box where they could understand how things were related to each other and what was the impact of that on the, the output. So identify the things that were important um, and understand their process a bit more. So I call that white box modeling. So this smart tra factory tech was really where they put a label on stuff and they could track it the whole way through their process. Um, and they wanted to be able to identify very quickly when the process that shouldn't be drive typos drift <laughs> um, and take corrective action. I only spotted that yesterday. Um, and, and this whole process was seen as a key enabler for them. So this was going to be the project that kind of showed them and showcased the, the data analytics power and, and statistical analysis power. So when we came in, as I said, I was lovely and green and I skipped in thinking we'd loads of data. And actually what happened was the data was everywhere and anywhere. So there was stuff that was on paper. We had to get that digitized. There was legacy equipment there where you had to go with a USB stick and physically download the data off it. And then there was also this <coughs> new automation stuff that was going on that was literally collecting real-time information in the machines as the, the things were being produced. And none of that was linked up. Um, and so I nearly had a heart attack because I don't know how to do this. Um, and we couldn't do any modeling because we'd none of the data in place. So we had a postdoc working on the project. She was amazing. She went into the company, worked with their IT group, and actually set up a centralized database for the first time. So to give you a feel for it, this is just the data collection piece and putting it all together. Um, their process engineers are spending about a day a week trying to access data. And then, they were wondering why they couldn't actually take corrective action fast enough. Of course you can't. There's no easy way of getting at your data. So this is not our typical skill set, the setting up the database bit. This is where you need people with that expertise. It's not, it's not simple. Um, it took 18 months out of a two-year project to do that. Um, so just give you, now we were slower because we didn't know what we were doing. Um, but you, just to give you a feel for kind of the timelines, right? And we could do nothing until this was there. So once that was in place, then we could 
we could clean it and we knew it was consistent and all of that we could do some really good stuff so one of the first thing we did was create this this click app so click is a is a type of software for the first time the process engineers could see their critical process variables and they could see it happening in real time so they could immediately spot when something was going wrong absolutely revolutionized their lives um, we also they were trying to do another project so they were absolutely certain that a particular part of the process was driving their scrap levels. Um, and once we had the data in there, we looked at it, we said, no, there's nothing here. That saved them a quarter of a million euro. That was how much that project was going to cost to run, to find nothing. Um, we, we found kind of locations where scrap was quite high. We also found, and this was very delicate, and again, I'll come back to this in a minute, um, the most variable parts of the process were the people ones. Um, so very challenging to manage that. But also we figured that what we saw was we could see real big spikes in scrap when certain people were working. Um, now, easy conclusion to make is they're the problem. Nope. People were cherry picking product. So the way they were remunerating people was the more product you fire through, the more money you make. The poor guys on Friday evening were getting all the rubbish. And we actually figured that out. Um, and we, we had to handle that really, really carefully. And they changed their inspection process on the basis of that. Um, and really what that project gave them, I suppose, was, look, here's what we can do when we have this stuff in place, um, and an insight into what they could do if they, they looked at that data um, a little bit more in depth later on. So what are the, what are the big things I learned personally? A, you have your business question in place. We were very lucky there. What data do you have? Do a little data landscaping exercise, right? Figure out what you have, what you don't have, what can you collect, what can't you collect, and then refine your question, if you have to. Um, building stakeholder buy-in. Um, one of the big um, complaints that employers come to us about our graduates, they say they're brilliant technically, they're fitting these are great stuff, they're doing great work, they can't communicate, they can't tell people what it is they're doing and why it's important. So there's no point in me going into a company and saying, look, lovely. No, you have to change your language and you have to communicate effectively. Um, and that goes in all directions. Um, you're going to meet a range of attitudes about this and a range of feelings about this because some people are super enthusiastic. Um, <laughs> Some people not so much, and I can completely understand that. You know, if you're telling people that this algorithm is going to take their jobs, I'd be mad. Like, I would not be very receptive to that. So, you know, I think, again, being, being careful about that, and I really liked, I can't remember who said it now, but it was Rachel, actually, around these being tools and not taking the human piece out of them. You know, they're re it's really important that we keep people at the centre of this. It's really important to be realistic about what you can achieve because everybody wants to be up at the stage five, everything is data driven, it's just not the reality. Everybody is down a little bit lower for the most part. Um, and so, you know, if you're starting out in this process, it can be really daunting. Um, it's very hard to know where to start, but, but we can start and we can get some stuff out there and we can start to move up um, as, we, as we improve. Data visualization is such an important part. Within the professional diploma, we deal with kind of the right-hand side here. So you will build this stuff from scratch. Um, and I'll show you some of the stuff that students have done actually on the program. But whatever tool it is that you use, being able to see your data is the first step at actually being able to have insights and be able to do something. Sometimes the data isn't going to tell you what you want to hear. That's challenging, so you might do a data an analytics project and expect lots out of it, and get zero. It, it, just, you just, it just might not be there. Um, there might be situations like us, so there might be HR issues where you, you go in and you find things and you need to be really, really careful about that. Um, and you can make mistakes, right? Let's be honest about it, that's, that's, that's what happens. So again, managing that. Your best friends need to be IT. Um, because they're the people who are going to be implementing this, you know, and be, allow you to be able to access things. And IT, husband kill me. I mean, you know, there's probably software development, data, you know, data engineering, all that, depending on your company, and depending on the size and scale of the data you're working with. And then finally, to wrap it up here, communication is key. 
So again, the way you communicate up is not the way you communicate out, it's not the way you communicate sideways, <laughs> that's the way you communicate. All of this has to be told with a story and that, you know, data analytics is about telling a story with data from the beginning. Um, and so we do try to teach some of that, but I'm really interested to talk to the other guys here actually about, about how we might work some more of that into the program. Okay, so I know everybody's exhausted, starving and lunch and all that is coming. Key, key take home messages, data are not created equally. Lots of data doesn't mean lots of useful data. They do very, very different things. Um, data visualization is great. Hiring one data scientist to do all of the work is going to end in, it's going to end badly. Um, it does need investment and, and time is our most valuable resource. It needs time. Um, and again, given that space to make mistakes, to figure it out. If you talk to companies who've done this really successfully, they've given the time to that statistical thinking slide and then things have kind of moved a little bit more easily there. And it is a long-term iterative process. You will learn things and you'll go back and you'll change and you'll redo and you'll learn as you go. Okay, so unashamed uh, talk about the, the PD then. This is my unicorn slide with all of this stuff. We're not going to make you unicorns, but we'll give it a go. Here's the bits that we'll touch on, right? So there's some from the maths and stats, some from the kind of problem solving perspectives. We'll do a bit of programming. We assume no prior knowledge with programming, okay? So if anybody is coming in and, and kind of a bit stressed about that, don't worry. We manage all of that. Um, and then thinking about how you might engage with stakeholders, data visualization, all of that kind of stuff. Um, we do, okay, so don't panic about loads of maths and stats. We do things from a very applied perspective. So can you apply the tools and understand when they go wrong? <laughs> it's probably the, the way to, to talk about it. Um, and just to show you some of this, the, the work. So the first module you'll do is, is in data analytics with R. The final project in that is to create an interactive data visualization tool dashboard. So this is actual stuff that some people have done on the program and this is completed within about seven weeks. Everybody can do this. So you can see all of these are interactive, they're drop downs, this is just a screenshot of it um, and you know you can imagine coming in we, we give them whatever they want, they can do it on whatever they want. You can do it on company data, you can do it on Hawks if that's what you're interested in, you can do it on Bart Simpson as well um, and there's loads and loads of things that people have done that's really interesting. We do some, some kind of stats learning, statistical modeling, storytelling, all of that kind of stuff, report writing. So what do our students tell us? Well, actually again, LinkedIn appears. This person was in the same job, wanted to move, did the program to try and upscale and get out of it. And what they found that it actually invigorated their current job as opposed to them wanting to move out of it. Um, and again, kind of getting lots more engagement on LinkedIn when those skill sets were going up on their page, which was great. And then this one was kind of a little bit more around, you know, the benefits of doing the coding, even though it's a little bit scary, um, from your normal Excel stuff that you might do, um, and being able to use that, and, and masterclass has been great, great in terms of the kind of things that they, they used. Okay, that's kind of it. So if you're interested in this, the applications for this are currently open. The closing date is the 5th of January. If you go to that link or scan the QR code, you'll, you'll get there. I'm the course director and I'm more than happy to take any comments, questions. <laughs>